Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot Country with the Weekly Comic Book Roundup. And we've got a, kind, of, kind of a big week, so we're going to be uh, splitting this up a bit. Um, kicking, off, kicking things off, we got this week's X Men books as well as this week's Spider Man related title. Starting with Hellions number 14. Where we left off, the uh, Locust Vile had a had arrived to wreak havoc on the Hellions and get revenge for Mr. Sinister's, uh, shall we say, transgressions in the Amenth. Also with them was the clone of Mr. Sinister, who ventured into Amenth with the Hellions during Ten of Swords. Uh, we begin on Araka, um with uh, the Regent of Soul addressing the, the Circle. Tarn uh, basically states he wants to go and, you know. Tarn's not happy about the fact that, well, what he considers to be his treasure, genetic material of himself as well as his locust vial, is in the hands of Mr. Sinister on Krakoa. Storm basically tells him, no, you are not going to Krakoa. I don't care. But he sent a bladefish. Um, from Mother Rapture. And he states that fate has made a liar of him again. So the Viler dealing with the Hellions. Um, Psylocke, Havoc, and Graker have no idea what's going on. Um, while Nanny, Orphan Maker, and Wild Child all feel focused. Um, and they make <laughs> the those three actually managed to do a bit of damage to repay the damage done to them back in Amenth. Um, there's also a uh, there's also a bit about the uh, the consequences of uh, the Amenthi resurrections. As we know, those killed mutants killed in the other world cannot be properly resurrected. Well, those killed in Amenth come back also somewhat changed. But, uh, in the middle of the battle, um, Tarn himself arrives. Smacks Danny to the side, and then basically, basically saying, you know, okay, you three were killed in, in Amenth, and now, you know, violence is inherent in your blood. Well, that is, your genes dance to the music of Amenth. He doesn't know how, he, how they sold this to him, but as they took it, he takes it back, and he basically... Turn put bits of the wild child back the way he was, and so the wild child, less confident, more and slightly, slightly more feral, just you know runs like runs to Psylocke like a you know like an injured dog. Um, Tarn also shares the. Uh, Memories of what Sinister did to Grey Crow, Havoc, and uh, Psylocke when they returned with them. But uh, as a means of making things even harder on the Locust Vile, 
Sinister Let's Lose an Army of Sinister Clones to take on Tarn to, to take on Tarn Locus Vile while he and the returned Sinister Clone escape. Apparently but they escape together because Sinister has intrigued his clone. Turns out that one of the, th you know, something he started working on a new project thanks to what was brought back from Ameth. A project called Chimera. The significance there being that uh, in the year 100 portion of Powers of Ten, we did see there were, there were bits, there were some elements added in the future history that Sinister created mutant chimeras. Uh, for example, we had Rasputin and the Cardinals, who are all pacifistic, and so on and so forth. Basically, the idea being combining the gen the genetic structure, the the genetic material of various mutants to create, well, a, ch a chimera. For example, the uh, among the, of those I mentioned, Rasputin. Rasputin possesses uh, seemingly the powers of both Mikhail and, or uh, not Mikhail. Uh, Piotr and uh, Ileana Rasputin, as well as uh, the abilities of Laura Kinney. I think she also had some. Uh, she also has uh, phasing abilities. I cannot, but I don't entirely remember. But The two sinisters venture through a gate that has been specifically modified to only allow Essex DNA through it, and basically, Sinister tells the uh, the Hellions to keep Tarn to keep Tarn busy, and that is where the issue ends. All right. Um, first of all, I know I've been, I constantly say how much gosh, how much I love Hellions. I do, I really do, and it's. It's kind of neat to see that it, it, you know to you know this has been just a fun book that felt very that had a somewhat that felt, <coughs> that felt both connected but at the same time not connected to everything else, only to show that it is it is quite connected to the overarching story. It should be interesting to see what the early uh, chimeras look like. Um, also. It's kind of surprising just how powerful Tarn the Uncaring truly is. Um, but yeah. Oh, Hellions does, uh, one, as always, does not disappoint. I mean, the book has been consistently good. Moving on to our next book, we've got X-Men number two. Where we left off, a, uh, well... On Game World, the, the new per owner and proprietor of Game World is basically running, taking bets to see who can, who among his uh, filthy rich um, clientele can wipe out all life on Earth to basically basically hit the reset, so that it could be you know colonized by uh, some. by someone, by a different race, and, you know, so they won't have to worry about Earth superheroes, because, well, there are a lot of those. We open with a quote from, of all people, Nova, uh, Richard Ryder. It was the hardest damn war I ever fought, and that bloody wave cost me my life. Mm. So the issue begins with, apparently... Rogue coming in on walking in on Gambit playing a game of poker in the treehouse with the thing. Hey, Ben Grimm loves poker. Okay, that that is canonical. Every this is a fact. All right, fact. Ben Grimm loves poker. I mean, really, it, it's a, it's it's a thoroughly established you know canon within the Marvel universe. The Rhino and Black Cat. Rogue is not happy, even though Gambit yeah, has offered to, you know, draw her to draw her in. But uh, 
yeah, it, it, game's over. And the, Ben Grimm even goes for it and says, yeah, I knew this was over as soon as she called you all three your fancy-ass names. Because, yeah, she does go for the full Remy Etienne LeBeau. Not just Remy LeBeau, no, no. Or Remy, no. Remy Etienne LeBeau. And, hey, you, you, you're, when your mom called you by, all, by your full name as a kid, you knew you were screwed. So, yeah, um... On Game World, yet another contender has come up to, well, wipe me out of the off face of the planet. Using the Annihilation Wave. Hence the Nova quote. Um, but one of theirs will be... But... Uh, a contender uh, as an associate who will be who will go into a pod and drop on Earth, and he does so in, in uh, outside of uh, Eola, Kansas. He drinks from a jug, and the annihilation pours forth from his body. The, uh, the Annihilation Wave is a truly heinous and immoral weapon to wield. And Earth was targeted with it for sport and profit. Two universal constants across the cruel galaxy. Um, back in New York, Gene is working with Sink on him be on, on, on training him on how to use her abilities so that when, she, when he has when he does use them he is able to use them just as as skillfully as she does. And they, they things are mentioned such as the uh, you know line, lines that should not be crossed and lines where you're just like I'm not sure if I should or should it, it, you know, it's not it's you know crossing going this far is gets a bit close to crossing those lines. But they go to uh, Kansas, deal, deal with the Annihilation Wave, um, working in concert with one another. Um, but uh, Polaris and Jean get inside the, manage to find out what's going on, at least to a degree. And, uh, after, after they figure out just what's going on, that, uh, basically using, combining Polaris's magnetism with Gene Slavity to create a, uh, an MRI machine for memories. But Sunfire takes out the wave. And the people of, of the town, who were, who were also involved in, in defending their, their town, um, after uh, Sunfire gives a, repeats the speech he gave at the uh, at the Hellfire Gala, well, they all, they invite everyone to the X-Men to stick around for food, Kansas barbecue. Which, and before uh, Sunfire refuses, Gene promptly interrupts and says, you know, we couldn't possibly refuse. The issue ends with an experiment being run by yet another member of Or- by a member of Orcus, Dr. Stasis, who is a, a human resources director, Orcus human slash resources director. He has gone over the autopsy report of Cyclops from the attack on the uh, on Soul's Forge, and but he finds it curious. Apparently, Cyclops is, seems to be alive and well, hale and hearty, living in a tree in New York. How could this be? Um, and he's also. He has also noted the fact that Ben Yurick has 
latched on to the, po the question of mutant death, namely because of jo Joel Carnation. How is Joel Carnation alive? There was no question he, before that he was dead. And uh, apparently, but Dr. Stasis suggests u utilizing the press as a way of uh, turning perception of mutantdom into that of a secretive island cult, which will, which could, it, he wants to push it that way, so to, uh, to cultivate, uh, or push it, in, 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 to push perception that way, so that they can utilize uh, humanity in a regression that they can cultivate to art to their needs. So, that is where the issue ends. Um, it's starting off, it seems, but I, honestly, I'm going to say it, two issues in, I think we're off to a good start. Um, and I do appreciate the fact that while, yes, we are getting more normal superheroics at the same time, you still have all the underlaw everything else about Krakoa. Moving on to Deadpool Black, White, and Blood number one. That's right. The Merc with a Mouth on his own Black, White, and Blood book. So the issue, be we get three stories, uh, as per usual. Read All Over by Tom Taylor and Phil Noto. Hotline to Heaven by Ed Brisson and Quilts Portisio. And Born in the USZORSUSR by James Deco. Starting off, we well, we got read all over. Kicks off. Wade's call. Wade's calling a handful. Uh, Wade's tries calling Peter Parker. MJ suggests he or tells him that nothing good can can come from answering the call. Then he calls Logan, who's riding a motorcycle somewhere. Well. Logan's surprised Wade has the number, and promptly ditches the phone to avoid, so that he doesn't have he no longer has so that Wade no longer has Wolverine's number. So then he calls Gabby, Honey Badger, Scout. Complained that no one would take would take his call, but she says that you know she's her, she's his best friend. He should have called her first, but he. He explains that they tried that in another draft, but it seemed weird to call a kid first with something so dangerous and violent. So she asks how, how violent, and well, he explains that, uh... Now he has, he hopes there aren't any children reading. And we also get a Marvel teaching moment that, um, remember, if you can see intestines on the outside of a person, the content is not for you. Or, well, remember, kids. If you can see intestines on the outside of a person, the content is not for you. That said, a uh, a company has made zombie lab animals. Again, as this is all a throw, this is a bit of a callback to Tom Taylor's all new Wolverine number thirty one, wherein Wade and uh, Gabby first dealt with zombie lab animals, but uh, they take down a zombie zebra after it blorches a person. Then go after the CEO. At Gabby's request. Also, it's possible that Deadpool was about to get was going to potentially get uh, infected, but Gabby cuts off his hand so just to make sure. But uh, so Gabby and Wade go to talk to the CEO, and in the end, Yeah, he saves the, the additional zebras. He's going to turn into zombies. Um, and Deadpool kills the evil CEO. And that's the end of the story. Next up, we've got... <laughs> Born in the... Next up, we have Hotline to Heaven. Better. Uh, okay, this is okay. That's that's not the yeah. So Deadpool is you know it's a day off. He's at home in his PJs and his mask and fuzzy slippers. Watch, and he's wanting to watch the movie Hotline to Heaven, starring B. Arthur, 1981 comedy. But it's not streaming anywhere. So he goes to 
Movie Mojo VHS and DVD rentals. Which is out of business. He, he wonders, how, how could this be? He was, he was just there t 12 years ago. But he stops some mugging uh, in the alleyway. Apparently the former manager lives in the remains in the building. But all the movies have, were bought by a private collector. In North Valinon. So Wade breaks into his, uh, Wade breaks in, slaughters his security, goes through, get, finally, you know, finally finds a copy of the movie on video, goes back home, puts it in, starts watching it, which he adds, colored cassette. That's how you know a movie is class. And apparently though, well, the movie's not as good as he remembered causing Wade to kick his TV and lament the fact that he's, he spent 20 bucks on a VCR just so he could watch it. And that is where the story ends. Finally, we have Born I can't, uh, in the USZORSUSR. Apparently, Omega Red and uh, Deadpool have a, have a uh, group, have a, you know, Omega Red and Deadpool text each other co co commonly. Yeah. Omega Red has started his own country. In Canada. So Wade goes to check it and he's been invited over but he's been invited to see it by by, by Arcady. Ultra special zone of the Omega Red sponsored United Soviet Republic, by the way, is the full name of the country. And we get uh, cultural embassy, which appear, which has which blares covers of music done by Omega Red. Agriculture, Ministry of Media and Machine Building, which is totally not building a nuclear reactor. There's Gary, who's local. He's cool. His beef jerky is so good you'll die. Cat circus and missiles. All, so many misses. Like, Deadpool is impressed, possibly also a little aroused. Of course, uh, we get the obligatory Canada jokes from uh, Omega Red, which causes a, which leads to a cameo from Alpha Flight members Puck and Sasquatch. Apparently, Sasquatch can sense when someone is uh, making fun of Canada. However, there is a problem in the. the there is a trouble in, in paradise. Ursa Major brought to to his former separatist mo movement, all because of the flag. Oh, and Gary turns out is on the side of Ursa Major. All because of their flags, which appear to have, well. Be just plain red flags. It, it yes, it is just to make fun of the the, the three color scheme of, of the series. And so, Deadpool sews a, a new flag. It's explained that the two flags are, are as such. Omega Red's flag is. A red omega symbol on a red field, a tradition that dates back hundreds of hours. Whereas the flags, it is uh, super patriotic. Red bear human hybrid on a red field. So, Deadpool's compromise flag. Traditional red omega symbol acting as a noble pillar from, from whence the proud red bear human hybrid rises into the firmament. And so, Ursa Major asks if Omega Red uh, would welcome an old bear back into the fold, which Omega Red says no, but he would welcome back a friend. And they stand, and of course, you know, the three of them are you know, proud of, of the new flag as Puck and Sasquatch show up, show up with a present for the new arrival in Canada. A Canadian flag. 
And the story ends with a mushroom cloud. So, okay, yeah. Um, I enjoyed the two previous Black, White, and Blood minis. Um, Carnage's little, you know, hit, Carnage has hit and miss moments. I think especially with all the various alternate reality type stuff with involving Carnage and alternate history stuff involving Carnage. It, uh, some of it just didn't click for me, I guess. Yeah, this, though, yeah, every, so far, every story clicks. It's great. I love it. Um, yeah. Um, also great, great seeing, uh, Tom Taylor, uh, doing some Marvel work as well. Uh, he's been doing some great, some great work over DC, most notably for, for me at least, Nightwing. But, uh, yeah, anyway, moving on to the last book for the video, Extreme Carnage, Lasher. So, where we left off Extreme Carnage, um, Phage was attacking Alchemax in the hopes of, uh, of seeing if there were any, if there was enough, if enough, of, 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 uh, enough of the screams and the survived to be viable, and also to kill Andy Benton for, you know, having damage to screams and the However, there to save her was none other than Agent Anti-Venom, Flash Thompson. And so, but the issue ended with Phage stabbing Andy through the chest. Which actually causes her to, well, explode, to explode. Guardsmen show up, but they're more interested in stopping Agent Anti-Venom than they are in stopping La Phage. Well, the Lasher symbiote latches into a, latches onto a dead body that's being kept in a, uh, it's being kept at home. Um, the, of course, Senator Crane has gotten into Lasher, got, gets to the Lasher. But, uh, and, but, uh, yeah, um, Antivita manages to escape the Guardsman and Phage with Andy, taking, him, taking her to, uh, decide to help create his suit, and basically, you know, hey, you know, help, you gotta help her. Lasher makes his way to D.C., uh, Carnage is, uh, manipulating his host, though, because Lasher, Lasher to me is very just like, hey, just leave me alone. But, yeah, leaving a trail of bodies in his w Lasher leaves a trail of bodies in his wake. Um, but the, back at Alchemax, it's explained that what, what was, the symbiote brought, the screen symbiote was damaged beyond repair, and all the all, all that could be done was uh, splice together with the antivenom symbiote. And he uses it, uh, cracks open the, the uh, specimen container with the symbiote and lets it take her. She is no longer a scream, but rather silence. And much like uh, Asian antivenom, or much like Antivenom, she, her uh, color scheme is uh, white, but instead of black, red, as uh, Scream was more red and yellow, so. Um, also, the... Um, there's actually a... Like, oh, damn it. Oh, the host of the Toxic Symbiote uh, cat, finds out what's going on at Alchemax and decides to go, he's got to go save his dad, who is one of the guardsmen at Alchemax. Also, it should be noted that uh, there's a good reason that Toxin's going to save his father is because, as I mentioned, his father, one of the guardsmen, well, the guardsmen are being slaughtered by Phage. But uh, Silence manages to... Uh, Injure Phage enough and then toss him to seemingly his death. But a, a new host arrives in the form of a dog for Phage. The Lasher Symbiote releases uh, its host at the Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial, 
and the host is uh, definitively killed by Carnage. I explained that the uh, Lasher's host was been dead for days by that point. But the brain just kept going. The body, the body was dead, but the brain just kept on going. So, well, Carnage finishes the job. as uh, Senator Crane makes his big speech. About how uh, Americans believe in an alien-free society, maybe from the silent majority, but they will not be silenced any anymore. And that is where the issue ends. Uh, these, these hit... Uh, The story itself is okay. Uh, the the big, the big, the neat parts were really just the stuff with uh, Andy and Flash. Um, it was interesting to see that the Lash was music is like, Connors, just leave me alone. Like seriously, I don't care about your BS anymore. Just let me be. Um, but uh, anyway, that's all for now. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, live long and rock hard.